19 subpoenas have been issued to those we believe have knowledge of the ongoing communist threat in Hollywood. Well, what kind of threat is that? Conspiracy to corrupt democratic values and bring about the overthrow of this nation. Using movies. <laughs> Any movie in particular? Or? Movies are the most powerful influence ever created. And they are infested with hidden traitors. Wow, this wasn't so bad in my head when I first pictured it. Anyway... In 1950, director Herbert Biberman served six months in jail for refusing to answer questions from the House and American Activities Committee, HUAC, about his political affiliation. In the aftermath of World War II, a time when people were buying 85 million movie tickets a week, the FBI became increasingly worried about the spread of communist ideas in Hollywood. However, the Bureau decided not to go after filmmakers openly and instead turned to HUEC, which could play it faster and looser with evidence standards and could strip defendants of some of the rights they would have had in an actual trial. Initially, the committee had struggled to find useful information against the suspected communists, but luckily for them, the FBI was happy to provide them with a list of friendly witnesses, which of course included Ronald Reagan, <laughs> background information on the first nine unfriendly witnesses they had subpoenaed, and the Bureau's diagnosis concerning the communist threat. The hearings began in 1947, but were temporarily suspended after the first ten witnesses declined to answer Hewitt's questions. Known as the Hollywood Ten, these screenwriters, producers, and directors were found guilty of contempt of Congress and served jail sentences ranging from six months to a year. Studios, for their part, decided to cover their ass by blacklisting anyone who refused to roll over for Hewick. By 1951, Academy Award nominee Paul Jericho and Academy Award winner Michael Wilson had joined the ever-growing ranks of blacklisted filmmakers. Wilson continued to make a living by writing screenplays under a pseudonym. In this manner, he wrote Bridge on the River Kwai and Lawrence of Arabia. Beaverman and Jericho, on the other hand, had something else in mind. In truth, the FBI wasn't altogether wrong in their assessment. Communist filmmakers such as Beaverman, Jericho, and Wilson did believe that working within the studio system allowed them to relay progressive ideas to a large audience. Jericho, for instance, was aware that Hollywood studios would never allow him to make a really revolutionary picture, but he thought that skillful writers could subtly influence the content of their movies to advance a political agenda. You know, real radical stuff, like, I don't know, changing society's attitude towards women, workers, black people, and minorities in general. But the FBI didn't need to panic. Hollywood had a long and proud history of self-censorship. One of my favorite examples is the movie Black Fury which was rewritten after the Production Code Administration expressed concerns about its portrayal of the coal police and the terrible working conditions at a Pennsylvania coal mine. In response, Hall B. Wallace of Casablanca fame ordered an immediate revision of the screenplay and stated, We should bend over backwards to eliminate anything unfavorable to the coal mining industry. So, Hoover really could have just chilled. It wasn't until they were blacklisted that Jericho and his colleagues felt they had the freedom to make the kind of movie they had always wanted to make. Which didn't quite work out, but we'll get to that. In response to the blacklist, Beaverman Jericho and screenwriter Adrian Scott started an independent film company, the Independent Production Corporation, or IPC. For their first project, they asked Michael Wilson to write a script inspired by the ongoing Empire Zinc strike in New Mexico. The result was Salt of the Earth, a movie about a group of Mexican-American miners, and Jenkins, who go on strike to demand safer working conditions, higher wages, and overall parity with white miners. After the mining company secures an injunction that forbids miners from picketing, their wives discover a loophole that allows them to take over the picket line. As a result, the men are forced to watch from the sidelines and occasionally do some housework. 
something that comes more easily to some than others. Have you learned nothing from this strike? Why are you afraid to have me at your side? Do you still think you can have dignity only if I have none? In retaliation, the company tries to evict one of the families involved in the strike, but the town comes together to thwart the eviction, and the mine higher-ups are forced to come to the table. Now, even though the Supreme Court had recently determined that studios would no longer control almost every aspect of movies' production, distribution, and exhibition, Salt of the Earth still encountered a united opposition made up of Congress people, Hollywood moguls, big labor bosses, and fearful Grand Countians, who got together to try and make sure that the communists in the flick didn't see the light of day. If I told you all the ways Salt of the Earth was sabotaged, we'd probably be here until the Trump administration blundered their way into herd immunity. So instead, here are some highlights. Yo no sé lo que es el destino Caminando fui lo que fui Ay a Dios que será divino Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como viví Yo me muero como in the end, the movie had a very limited national release and fizzled out quickly. Although it did run in China, some countries in Europe and Latin America, the Soviet Union and Canada, the US government made sure the film creators didn't see a cent of their international earnings. And this begs the question. What was it about a small independent movie made by blacklisted filmmakers and actors and Chicanx working class peeps that made everyone lose their sh <laughs> The political impact of movies has generally been gauged by mainstream audiences' reaction to the finished product. You know, did Wall-E make you hate giant vertically integrated corporations? The problem with that approach is that, as much as we may believe media to be a determining factor in shaping people's attitudes towards social issues, that is not always the case, and measuring a film's political impact is more complex than many of us think. David Whiteman has given this some thought and proposed a coalition model that assesses a movie's impact based on three areas. One, how the development, production, and distribution of a movie influences the interactions between producers, participants, activists, decision makers, and citizens. Two, how a film may influence not only the audience's behavior, but also that of community activists and or government officials. And three, how a movie may create and sustain alternative spheres of public discourse. The making of Salt of the Earth certainly changed the way director Herbert Biberman thought about casting choices. Initially, he had turned to his wife, Academy Award nominee and blacklisted actress Gail Sondergaard, to play the role of Esperanza Quintero, the movie's protagonist. However, in consultation with other members of IPC, Biberman concluded that choosing white actors to play Mexican-American roles would mirror the kind of exclusion that had resulted in their banishment from Hollywood. Culturally and socially, as well as politically and economically, vast numbers of our American people have been blacklisted for centuries, said Bieberman. Were we, the new blacklisted, to blacklist the older ones? Eventually, the role of Esperanza went to Rosaura Revueltas, a minor's daughter and actress from Durango, Mexico. Also, Gail Sondergaard had already done some critically acclaimed yellow face in the past, so she could let this one go. Moreover, Despite the massive boycott Salt of the Earth faced in the U.S., the film eventually gained a cult following among lefties, feminists, and Latinx people. So much so, it even made a bit of a comeback in the 1960s. Since then, the movie has been used by social justice groups as an educational tool or simply to renew members' energies and commitment to their activism. For example, the Confederación General del Trabajo de Andalucía organized a screening followed by a discussion in 2014. And they weren't the only ones. What's more, 
From 2016 to 2018, Grant County residents participated in the Salt of the Earth Recovery Project, whose goal was to collect and celebrate the stories of the women and men that participated in the Empire Zinc strike. The project also recorded and preserved artifacts used in the strike, such as buttons, murals from the Union Hall, and even the corridos that the strikers used to sing at the picket line. De lo que a mí me ha pasado, que yo fui encarcelado. Perhaps Salt of the Earth's most lasting and widespread effect is that it continues to create alternative spheres of public discourse. Clearly, it could never have been a commercial success the way later labor films such as Norma Ray or Sorry to Bother You were but it did create spaces outside the mainstream where people can discuss issues raised by the movie, such as the intersection of race, class, and gender. When I reached out to Latinx scholars in the United States, for example, I got very moving responses from people who felt the film had been a formative experience in their lives and use it in their teaching. One of them, Pilar, even invited Otto, the descendant of a long line of miners from Arizona, to come to her class and share his experiences. In the larger scheme of things, salt of the earth may seem of minor importance to many, but its accomplishments in the face of huge obstacles are remarkable. Movies may not be the silver bullet that brings down white supremacy, economic exploitation, or misogyny, but they can be a tool that softens the ground for social change. Look, I have no idea if global warming is going to kill us before we can be truly free, but anything that keeps that idea alive and encourages us to fight for it y de pasito le asusta los frijoles al government, big labor, and Hollywood liberals and conservatives can only be a good thing. This short essay leaves little room for nuance when talking about the movie's development and production, and I decided to focus mostly on the positive, but identity politics, the bane of working class movements if the dirtbag left is to be believed, compels me to point out that both Jericho and Bieberman failed in certain aspects regarding gender and race. For example, considering the amount of work Sylvia Jericho and Sonia Dahl Bieberman did while the movie was being made, they should have been credited as producers at the very least. But the best Herbert could do was to recognize Sonia as IPC's secretary. Moreover, Although Michael Wilson and Herbert Bieberman made good decisions, such as hiring auxiliary 209 women and local 890 minors as the movie's non-professional cast, and asking for their feedback regarding the screenplay, they still thought Salt of the Earth could capture the essence of Chicanx people, which, yikes, I had to get that off my chest. If you'd like to learn more about the Empire's Zinc Strike and the making of the movie, I highly recommend Ellen R. Baker's On Strike and On Film. It would also be great if you could visit the Salt of the Earth Recovery Project's website. The learning resources are amazing. Thank you. Okay, bye. Si no creyera en mi sonido, si no creyera en mi silencio, ay, qué cosa fuera, qué cosa fuera la masa sin cantera, una masa y juecho de cuerdas y tendones. Un revoltijo de carne con madera.